to order on the given motion. And I invite the Prime Minister to open the case that stands in their name. Yeah, here. Hi, just to check, am I visible and audible? Okay, great. Once again, I use he, him pronouns and POIs to be given verbally, please. I won't be looking at the chat. Starting my speech in three, two, one. The root of all of Africa's ailments is poverty. And when allowed to fester over generations, opposition forms an ecosystem of chronic inefficiencies that predate on the livelihoods of the most vulnerable in the forms of disease and destitution. We are so proud to propose. Before I introduce two arguments within this speech, what exactly do we support under the side of proposition? First of all, a three-prong model. Firstly, we think post-colonial African states share a few characteristics, namely one, strong grassroots movements formed during colonial rule to fight for independence. Two, their economic system was designed for colonizers to extract wealth from them, so poverty is rampant. And three, note that all post-colonial African states in the status quo pursued a mixed bag of political and economic strategies. So this debate must be about reimagining the world on which of the two we should have prioritized at the point of independence under the rule of a good faith government. Otherwise, neither team can deliver their promise of economic or political rights. Two, the process of fighting for economic and land reparations will be spearheaded by the state. This will look like roughly three things. Firstly, establishing committees responsible for fairly redistributing wealth and property who prioritize distribution from those who unfairly took wealth under colonialism to the economically disenfranchised. Secondly, establishing quotas within the workplace and schools to ensure equitable access to employment and education. And thirdly, cash transfer programs to marginalized groups. Three, we think in reimagining the world, a post-colonial Africa absent of civil and political rights will not be a society that lacks all fundamental human rights. This is because local leaders in a newly independent state have directly suffered under colonialism, incentivizing them to ensure that the basic humanity which was eroded under colonial powers is now safeguarded. Therefore, fundamental human rights such as the freedom from slavery and torture exist, where civil and political rights such as expression, the political expression and assembly are not specifically codified by the law. Two arguments in this speech. The first, on how immediate economic relief is second to none in safeguarding the livelihoods and upliftment of African nations. There are three parts underneath this argument. First of all, I'd like to note that in the hierarchy of competing rights, economic upliftment must supersede political empowerment. This is because economic rights are instrumental to the right to life, because the biggest obstacle is in the state. It's starvation, disease, and intergenerational poverty. Finite resources mean that millions spent to build voting booths on op could have been used to feed the malnourished and earn yeah. sustainable income so their children could go to school instead of being forced into child labor. Perishing means there aren't any political expressions to be made, because when you survive, it becomes your utmost priority. The the right to life is a gateway right that is fundamental to human dignity and comes prior to everything else. Why then is saving lives exclusive to prop? Because it's a time-sensitive issue. Lives are at stake. Democracy requires the state to carefully debate, pass, and implement public policies. So even if you get political rights, economic policies will only come way after. In the meantime, the lives we lose waiting for immediate relief are irreversible. But economic policies on the side of op will be far less efficient as state resources are stretched thin for nationwide projects. On prop, direct cash transfers and land in the hands of the people gives them the agency to ameliorate their specific economic situation. Those who need medical care and shelter can get it directly instead of waiting on the state to develop things like public housing or hospitals. But secondly, we think our economic reparations uniquely empower the people in a few key ways. In many African states, natives were robbed of their land and consigned to barren parts of the country. In South mm -hmm. Africa, the 1913 Natives Land Act was apartheid's original sin because it conscripted Black South Africans who formed 76% of the population and restricted them to land ownership in just a tenth of the country's land, systematically shutting them out of metropolitan cities. Only we reverse it by the restoration of land rights because ownership over land improves integration between ethnic groups because we prevent things like segregation and we allow individuals to use their land as collateral for things like investment to build their wealth right? provide access to education and jobs for disenfranchised groups it opens up access to income streams where otherwise they'll be impoverished allowing access to upward social mobility but lastly we think economic reparations in the wake of decolonization addresses africa's crippling underdevelopment because their underdevelopment stems from foreign powers using them to extract natural resources and exploit cheap labor when consumers are in poverty 
impoverished, there isn't a viable market. And labor exploitation perpetuates the cycle of poverty because workers never gain adequate disposable income to attract meaningful FDI. Economic reparations means consumers will have purchasing power. Hence, foreign investors won't stop at just setting up low-cost supply oh, chains. Wow. But rather, they'll set up businesses and invest in the growing economy. This sparks job creation and lessens the economic burden of the state when FDI contributes towards growth. But without economic reparations, we think opposition creates a unique vulnerability in Africa, as prolonged destitution means they're more prone to the outbreak of things like conflicts, disease, and death. The lack of resources exacerbates existing social ills and is insufficient to create any meaningful impact. Before I move on to the second argument, sure, I'll take a point. In a post-colonial impoverished, largely backward economy like Africa, who creates all these jobs, has enough money to create healthcare and education, and how? So we think, first of all, if you're going to contest the lack of resources, that is a problem your side needs to deal with as well. Because note that the implementation of rights is also contingent on resources. If you solely want to make this debate the fact that post-colonial Africa the nations are broke and they have absolutely zero resources, your side cannot claim your benefits as well. But moving on to the second argument as to how civil and political rights cannot be exercised meaningfully without wealth. Three parts here. The first, wealth inherently allows participants of a democracy to gain the political system in two ways. One, through lobbying. The financial elite and the state will collude to create an ecosystem of power at the top where political and economic favors are constantly exchanged. Companies that receive state subsidies and contracts in a cement themselves as the dominant market force. And these newly crowned financial elite then fund political campaigns of the ruling parties to continue receiving these favors. Note that this is a problem that exists within developed democracies as well, where political rights are strongly entrenched, like in the US, where lobbying actively undermines the public will. But two, we think meaningful access to free speech and association is impossible without money, because the financial elite who dominate mainstream media have excessive channels to exercise those rights. They have platforms to shape public opinions in their favor and a greater influence in determining which parties and candidates get into power. Thus, within, if you do not challenge the concentration of wealth, the financial elite have a chokehold on power. What keeps them in the driving seat of democracy is to keep others locked in an inescapable poverty trap via the deregulation of industries, low wages, and low redistribution of wealth, which is exactly what we see in Africa today. But the second part of this argument is how economic oppression is in the heart of Africa and suffering, and political rights uniquely fail to alleviate it. Because the lack of economic enfranchisement means that while segregation may be abolished on paper, it's purely tokenistic because Black South Africans stay trapped in slums because they simply do not have the resources to move elsewhere while white Africaners prosper across city lines. That is the world of modern apartheid that opposition stands for. We think, therefore, money is the prerequisite for the state to enshrine rights. Because when faced with limited resources in a nation's cost, First, the state has no choice but to trade off certain rights. In those instances, the wealthiest actors who have the largest political say get their rights paradise. Finally, we put power back in the hands of people by giving them wealth. Because disposable income empowers individuals to make their political opinions impactful. They're able to fund campaigns and signal their strength to governments because it cements their influence as an important voter bloc. Hunger rings louder than any political promise. On opposition, they hand the impoverished words we uniquely grant them the ticket to survival, I'm so proud to propose. I think the first prop and my first talk. Just a second, just setting up a timer. Hey, can I just confirm that you all can hear and see me okay? Perfect. I'll be taking POIs verbally. So yeah, just I, I don't think I'll see it in chat. Okay. Starting in three, two, one. On opposition, we're gonna prove three things in this debate. Firstly, how we lessen ethnic conflict. Secondly, why democracy is far better than reparations. And thirdly, Arjen will tell you all how we get far better FDI access. Before that, I just wanna be incredibly clear on what the enshrining of civil and political rights actually looks like. 
it looks like ensuring free and fair elections. It looks like having these elections being fair in terms of the election watches there. It looks like lobbying restrictions from companies, for example. Because look, coding this in, in constitutions allows like citizen petitions, for example. Understand this. This is not a four-year thing, right? It's not you voting every four years. It's a full-blown culture that's in present. Why is this likely to be done well? Firstly, I want to be clear that most people want to work together because they have a common interest, i.e. the narratives of the country, the narrative of independence, the right to self-govern. But no, crucially, in response to like their appeal in the POY state that they that this thought asks them, I think that NATO, the UN, and international treaties are likely to be far greater on our side of the house. And they're exclusive because of the fact that the country is seen as being interested in democracy. On their side of the house, this is not necessarily present because of the fact that on our side, the fact that this country is that's interested in democracy, we're more likely to get help from international institutions in that sense. But I want to be clear as well. Why is it likely that there's going to be a quasi-democracy on side of opposition in the absence of enshrining rights? The first thing I noticed, the process of redistribution of, of like or, or significant like economic reparations likely involves things like being dictatorial like at least right if a government for instance has all the power and all the resources and determining how land is di distributed i think they have like the ability to give a lot of these land to their friends they have the ability to do things like cement the dominant the, 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 the power in some way for instance like this happened in, in singapore right okay first argument then how does proposition increase ethnic and political violence the first thing i note here is that most african countries and nations just have sig they just have like extremely diverse religious parties in general they're incredibly diverse post colonization. Why? Because I think the British and French often like actively brought different ethnic groups from their areas and they colonize in order to do things like mine certain precious minerals, for example, or do things like set up railways, right? Therefore, they needed like large labor, labor pools in that sense. But secondly, I think they wanted a divide and conquer policy so that different minorities could not just unite and rise up in protest against them. And I think that's why they drew borders arbitrarily. Now, here's the thing given that most African states are thus multi ethnic, the failure to truly enshrine democratic rights means that there's going to be far more conflict between these tribes. Understand how this undercuts a lot of the proposition material, because like to the extent that let's say reparations are somewhat helpful, the point of which there's some sort of conflict means that a lot of there's going to be significant economic harm as well on their side of the house. Now note here, what, what, why is there going to be harm? Because like, look, I think the failure literally means that you're literally taking away money from let's say why? one tribe and giving that money away from the, the other tribe. It looks like giving taking money from the Hutus and giving it to the Tutsis, for example. The reason you have this incentive is because the right to let's say the, the, the because like right after you become in, in, independent, you want to get resources, right? You want to help your loved ones in your in, in these oppressed tribes, but also you don't have like greater tensions until like the negotiation processes actually get ugly. Let's be clear on what happens on the comparative. Firstly, I think we get far more, we get like power sharing agreements on our side between the majority and minority tribes a lot more because democracy itself involves this process of negotiation to figure out the best way to, to represent people. It looks like the, the majority and minority tribes get in different areas of land and redistribution of natural resources between these tribes because they have that common agreement to help ensure the democratic right to vote is within people. Why is this so much better than their side of the house? The first thing I note here is no, it involves absolutely better relations, no thank you, between parties and incentives for them to portray these relations to their populace. It looks like keeping each party in check with regards to abuses. That is to say, if one party abuses against their people, for instance, the other tribe can do more to show how they're better. In that sense, I think it also incentivizes each party to give, like, re each tribe to give rep reparations to an, an economic goods to those people on, on the ground, because there's a race to the top. On, look, look at the implication here, panel. This literally co a lot of proposition's benefits on that sense. Secondly, even if like power sharing agreements you have shared, like the unifying narrative of the, of the government is like really important here, right? Because this is when you look at like the unified, this, this is literally when you like aim to look at the unified history, right? One of your independence, like how you have the right to democracy, right? The right to self govern This is better because our obviously narrative is far better because it forces tribes to focus on the common goals. Either way panel, on proposition side, there's backlash. There's backlash from different stakeholders in post-colonial African states. In the case of reallocation of resources from one ethnic tribe to another, the fact that they're like long years of tribalism it means that it's far worse and far harsher because i think like you would refocus on who would come into power right yeah. as a result it's going to be less accountability on their side of the house you literally internalize racist narratives what are the impacts of this the first thing is this is a significant decrease in conflict on our side of the house because it involves fewer people notice how bad propositions world is oftentimes these communities get closer to each other and they can be impoverished the fighting that erupts on their side of the house looks like skirmishes between people on the ground it looks like the destruction of their own houses further impoverishing them this strips away a lot of their economic benefits in the first place before i move on sure 
your argument on preventing ethnic conflict is contingent on political participation. But if people are still suffering tangibly because their economic needs aren't fulfilled on your side of the house, they simply don't have the time nor the resources to engage in politics. The first thing I note here is that, look, we literally give you two reasons as to why people are incredibly likely to be participating here. Why? Because like the, there are father figure narratives, for instance, there's the narrative of independence. I think on our side of the house, there is going to be political participation. I think that's symmetric. The difference is the fact that there's going to be more conflict on your side of the house, right? But more crucially, never actually prove to us that you're going to get like fair redistribution in, in the first place. The summary of this argument here is that people fight a lot more on propositions world. The fighting worsens the issues on their side. Second argument, I think this outweighs a majority of the proposition case, because I want to prove here why democracy is just far better than reparations. At its most basic level, I think the right to choose is the prerequisite to utility. Because note, at the point of a nascent democracy, a lot of people have like similar wants. They have food, they want food, they want income, they want infrastructure, etc. Given that the outcome of the prioritization can be uncertain to extent, I think the fact that we get things like more economic and more systems, the fact that we can ensure longer term structures for, for like politics in general is far better. For example, the right to protest or if, if on their side of the house, like like reparations can be redistributed to wealthy people only, I think this is entirely possible, right? I think on our side, the fact that you can at least protest and get your point of view heard is essential to fixing such kinds of policy. Moreover, the ability to have a true democracy is what ensures policies in general are like far better. Note here, democracy fosters a culture of transparency and information spreading because it asks for criticism and ideas and checks and balances within the government. As a result, I think we're far better in this debate panel because we prevent against the worst forms of harms that accrue on side proposition. What is the way off here? I think we prioritize like the worst forms of harms or the greatest benefit here as the worst harms actually involves like taking away people's rights, right? There's a simple in intuition bump here. This is why you like have a moral duty to not kill somebody, but you do not have a moral duty to, to, to like to give charity to that person. Notice here, voting every four years is quite insufficient. You need the vigor of culture of petitions, you need town halls. But the second thing I note here, and this is like, this is unpreemptive in general coming from proposition, right? I think it's quite clear that money can be stripped away in, in, in the future. The ability to have a free and fair election and press is literally what guarantees stability on the other side. Why is this the case? Note that future unaccountable politicians can also be in place. Like they can put bad economic policies, for example. They can be inflation. They can be political instability. That can make your plot of land literally worthless on their side of the house. The ability to vote is what ensures politicians fix these issues. Why is democracy so certain on the other hand? It's because people have similar goals. They have similar policies when nation building. They stop government abuse on our side of the house. They can vote for basic infrastructure bills. The leaders on proposition world are not necessarily going to be that great with economic policy in the first place. And this like just rebuts a lot of their case as well. If leaders of such movements have like better experience and knowledge for canvassing and setting up ballot boxes, because they're often indulging this in, in the first place, they researched these methods. I think they're far better on our side because on their side, they don't necessarily have that good experience with economic redistribution. In that sense, we're better on our side of the house because we get far better policy. We help these African nations. I thank the first top speaker and like the second prop here, here. Hi, can I check that I'm audible? Okay, great. Um, I'll take POIs verbally, so just unmute yourself. Starting in three, two, one. It seems like a no brainer at face value panel that we are the black majority. If we all had one vote, we would control and gain the system. Namibia's largest, largest racial group, the Ovambo people, which is half the population, and black South Africans, which are two thirds of the population, are statistically in status quo, the poorest and the most ill-treated individuals in their homeland. In Namibia's capital and financial hub, hub Windhoek, not only are most businesses white owned, but the whites overwhelmingly live in the heart of the city, while the Ovambo people and other racial groups live in the outskirts or outright slums. Was this the will of the people was what opposition needed to answer. Because I think the reason they have to lose this debate is they are far too parallel in just arguing in a vacuum about democracy. We gave you argumentation that directly had comparatives as to why even in the perfect scenario of opposition, why economic redistribution and economic prior economic rights could not take a back seat because it was about survivability and the livelihoods of individuals right now. The safety net mechanisms would only kick in and it's far too reactionary when individuals were already 
lost. That was the comparative that was made clear in the third minute of first proposition that saw little to no engagement at all. I will do the wing and I will do the comparatives later on, but that is just something to note at the top of this speech. I have three things to do in this speech. I'll number one, give you observations and framing. Number two, I'll strengthen the case that was unresponded to and add additional layers of responses and analysis. And lastly, I'll introduce a third substantive argumentation as to how economic empowerment is the right a healthy democracy. No, I'll take one later. Moving on to observations and responses. Note that first on their mechanism, they wanted to just assert that they would have free and fair elections and in, in response to our harm that they did not prepare for, would just simply ban lobbying. Note firstly, this is just a literal frivolous response. You can't just assert banning lobbying, especially in the context of post-colonial African states where these are nascent democracies. And we've also outlined and highlighted that even in entrenched democracies and strong Western liberal ones, lobbying isn't actually banned. But even if we assume this were to be true, they never actually responded with this catch-all response towards the argumentation at all. Because we told you two unique things regardless if you ban political lobbying. Number one, in terms of even if you ban political lobbying, what is the enforcement mechanism insofar as they still haven't told us why the individuals on the ground are financially empowered to actually be act in order to actually be political agents within society to hold them accountable. But number two, social privilege still existed, which meant that the second analysis that came out from first proposition as to how the elite control media, the elite are the ones that control TV and airtime and interviews, only the wealthy and privileged and the words that they say hold weightage in society. So regardless, even if you believe you could ban lobbying, the social influences that you had still existed. They need to deal with that in second opposition or they can see the entirety of the harm still. But third, we told you even if it was the case where you banned lobbying, it was implicit expectations when you gave massive amounts of money to political donors. So it did not matter that I explicitly said, vote for, I will give you a million dollars and therefore you don't vote for certain policies. It was about corporations implicitly giving a large sum of money to large political candidates and assuming implicitly there's a promise for certain outcomes and certain policies. So their catch-all response in their own mechanism and their own setup does not actually work and they can't just assert that it will be done well. Because note that at first, the POI to first off proposition is entirely, entirely disingenuous. In terms of, they want us to defend our broken system that for some reason, if we are the same government and the same structure, on our side, it will be done badly. On our side, these malevolent actors will subvert the economic redistribution, but on their side, in the same actor that would grant the same political rights, they will do it perfectly and give it to each and every individual. Either this debate needs to exist cleanly, where we both assume we have the fiat to institute our policies initially, or their side needs to also argue for discrimination of individuals, because you would likely not institute and give Black African Americans, sorry, not African Americans, Black South Africans, the same level of political leverages as the white majority because that would quote unquote anger them. That is the crucial observations and responses. They have to resolve this or their case needs to concede to prop. But on to material responses. On the idea of conflict, know that we think it's highly simplistic why conflict exists as the backbone of the case. They said that you're angry at the minorities for taking money and redistributing it to individuals. Note that this exact same analysis applies to them because the majority that was privileged from colonialism under divide and conquer, certain ethnicities benefited more. Certain ethnicities were granted the right to education through English schools, for example. Some of them were ag uh, allocated to more proliferating and more um, more socially uplifting jobs, for example, in the agriculture sector, where some individuals were forced to work in the mines, which means that granting them equal, if not the same political rights in a, in a case where they would be the overwhelming majority would also make you pissed off at minorities and equate to the same kinds of outcomes. Their only assertion as to why you would be able to correct this is power sharing agreements that incentivizes the race to the top, and therefore you co-opt all of proposition's benefits in the first place. We told you in our second proposition speaker two things. In terms of number one, political participation is unlikely to exist insofar as the individuals are the most impoverished, which meant that it isn't the race to the top, but rather it's extremely easy to cater to the simplistic needs of individuals on the ground to keep them quiet. It looks like giving them financial aid from politicians and say, vote for me, giving them bags of rice, and therefore that is sufficient for them to vote for you in office, which means that they don't get a race to the top because it's extremely easy to sway these individuals into voting into those systems. So it's likely the exact opposite insofar as you're able to be 
exploit the individuals where you don't give them economic resuscitation in order to mobilize. But second, the right democracy is more important than reparations. All they say here is that the right to choose is important and the democracy fosters transparency. Before I move on to the point, I'll take a, um, move on to this, I'll take a point. So you talk about how rich white people are the minority, but they have the majority of political and economic power. So isn't it more likely that the black majority will be able to vote these people out and potentially regain some amount of power, which doesn't happen on your side? The entire second argument from first proposition when it was explaining to, explaining to you why money was important in deciding political outcomes in terms of the social influences, the social spheres, because the status quo based on their world should not be the status quo that we see today. But their only reason of logic for why democracy is more important than reparations is the right to choose. We told you straight up from first proposition why the right to choose takes a backseat insofar as exercising the autonomy requires you to be in a certain level of financial privilege to access all of those sorts of things. Whether individuals even vote in the first place is questionable insofar as people are more more insofar as people care more about their financial survivability in the meantime i think this takes out two of their argumentations but it was also comparative the only thing proposition was willing to do on to a third argumentation then as to why economic empowerment is the backbone of a healthy democracy three parts a economic upliftment is exactly what elevates the social class of citizens to become the working class majority quotas for unemployment land for businesses and disposable income to increase employability are all the conditions prop creates to mobilize the impoverished to the working class this translates to more participation within the education system when children no longer have to choose food over school, which increases political literacy within the population. This argument is uniquely explaining to you why only economic rights needs to be first rather than and it leads to an eventual organic roadmap to political change. But second, the working class form the largest and most influential persons in every democratic system. We never require the legalization of formation of, um, in order to associate or the right to vote. Grassroots labor movements birthed from the economic demands of the most populous and the most empowered are the individuals that control the system. This is for two reasons money and critical mass. Money is the prerequisite, as we explained earlier, to increase political awareness and participation. Only when we enable participation do we get the critical mass needed to pressure the state to institute change. The same way women's suffrage movements never had the right to vote, us being able to be in positions of education and leverage enable us to mobilize and engage and get the right to vote in the process of advocacy. If you want to actually uplift the individuals on our side and the people that are the most disenfranchised, side with prop. I thank the second prop speaker and invite the second off. I hope I'm audible and visible. Okay. I'm going to begin in three, few as verbally, by the way, sorry. I'm going to begin in three, two, one. Panel, here's the deal. If you have white people being rich and black people being poor, that's because governments structurally prefer the former. Governments are corrupt. Governments are discriminatory. Proposition gives in the nation and all we do is try to hold them accountable. Three questions on team opposition. One, which side gets economic and land reparations? Two, which side gets less toxic spheres? And three, which side gets better foreign relations and investment. But first, I want to clarify something. They make it seem like we don't give people food, water, or housing on our side and just toss ballot boxes at them and ask them to vote. Democracy, democracy includes certain taxing systems. It includes investing in things like healthcare, education. However, we just don't prioritize economic and land reparations and do something as radical as making a post-independent state entirely socialist and distributing all the land, like trying to do so equitably. Now, which side gets economic oh, yeah. and land reparations. We tell you we get it better because we're able to get it later on as the democracy progresses as people emerge. Why is our likelihood better? Firstly, because their side of the house isn't equitable. The only incentive that people on their side have, meaning to say, after you are elected, it is likely that the independence party is in charge. These are people that are likely to be power hungry. This is why they sacrifice so much so that at the end of the movement, they're able to be in a position of power. We don't think they have any other overarching incentive to do this. We don't think they're messiahs as such. We tell you on our side, because what happens on their side is simple, right? There is backlash when they engage in this, meaning to say, 
countries in the West, due to increasing McCarthyism, due to increasing like a capitalist tendencies, uh, actively like discriminate against socialist states. Right. Meaning to say, even if they prove incentive, they do not prove capacity. Why? Ariman says this, we don't get a response. Economic issues are not the expertise of liberation leaders. They often have good oratory ability, right? We tell you that on our side, we have a number of things. Our likelihood is this. We have foreign help from Germany. We have foreign help from the UN, from the US that help us set up democracy. We have elections. They know all the canvassing, all the hotspots of people when it comes to things like elections. The very nature of insurrection is self-government means that a lot more more prepared for this than they are radical economic policy. We have foreign help. We're able to get political participation. But we think even, even though, like, even if we don't get this, it's better to have a bad democracy than to have their best case scenario. Because even on their side, you are more likely to even unknowingly mess up economic distribution than you are to get away with democratic backsliding intentionally right better to have the, better to have our worst than their very best right but we think the likelihood is this on backsliding here's what happens we prove to you that democracy is a prereq to economic and land reparations we co op to their benefits, meaning to say you need accountability in order to actually prove things, meaning to say when they say things like the elite or like the elite will still on their side of the house distribute land in a, in a, like, in a manner that favors the elite, except on our side, what happens is you are able to protest. They say it themselves, the media controls the narrative and the media is elite filled. On our side, we do not need the media. We can have people protesting on the streets. We can have people submitting petitions. This is a unique, exclusive benefit that only we get. We get better cooperation when it comes to actually pursuing economic reparations. Why? Because on our side, when you slowly immerse into a democratic system, people themselves see the need as a fruit of democratic discussion that land distribution is necessary. On their side, they blindly follow liberal leaders. On our side, you still have these leaders. You still have a post-independent society because we think the likelihood is that you have someone that is either the son or the liberation leader themselves, right? We think you're still able to gather people. You're still able to galvanize people. But on our side, crucially, you still have less international scrutiny. We think with time, McCarthyism does die out after, say, the 1970s. We think you're able to then get better on our side. Now, why do we get less toxic spheres? This is something we absolutely win on panel because you do not respond to it. Or even tells you that there are heaps of conflicts within these societies. Meaning to say, let it aside the white and the black spinner, right? What we think is important also is the tribal conflicts. We're able to settle ethnic conflicts with democratic negotiation. We think that's easier to do that with the political capacity that democracy brings you. On the other hand, when land comes into play, you tend to take, take things personally. They try to make it seem like negotiation will be fruitful without democracy. I really don't see why. Argument three, then, on which side gets better foreign relations and investment. This is an independent path to victory. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They say we need to solve the problem of no resources on our side, too. Here's how we do that. This is not contingent on whether the democracy is fully functioning or not, because this is contingent only on the existing of a good political system. Now, why does, invest why does investment matter? Panel, you are a poor country that has been deprived of land, power, and resources, and there are virtually no industries that exist post-independence. The only actors here that can help you are those of foreign investors. This means the amount of money the nation can get in the future is going to be far more than what there is now, and we secure that. This is also non-contingent on whether the leader actually has good incentives or not. Which actors invest? Foreign companies and NGOs of the West are irreplaceable. Why? Because they are by miles the richest actor that can invest, invest in other countries. Their history of acquiring resources through colonization, their presence of strong institutions, help them incentivize foreign in uh, investment. We give them two unique benefits that they mitigate. First, we give businesses guaranteed rights to democratic checks and balances. Right. Businesses from the West are used to certain legal practices and norms like guaranteed property rights, IP laws, and civil liberties, which means more familiarity. They let this be when you have people previously owned property forcibly seized and redistributed, especially white contacts that you know. This is bad for business confidence. Secondly, we think during the Cold War, there is heaps of backlash about everything that is even remotely socialist. The US is increasingly McCarthyist. They have an incentive as the torch bearers of democracy democracy to actively invest in countries that show democratic potential. We instantly 
about that, they mitigate it. Now, before I get to even their best case in terms of FDI, I'll take a few. You wanted to co-op all of our economic benefits, such as land redistribution. So then deal with your own harms of tribal individuals feeling robbed. Why are you exclusive and not able to suffer these same harms if you want the same policies just later on? I think on? I made that like, painfully clear. Later on, democracy works. You have more accountability. You are able to have peaceful negotiation. On their side, the powerful tribe can just seize the land of the less powerful tribe and there'll be no one to hold them accountable. There'll be no systems of protest. Time is the factor here. We do co-opt your benefits. Their best case panel is this. They get investment, but they get investment from the USSR because the USSR has a history of going towards socialist orientations and that, like, that's more likely on their side. Why is this dependence on the USSR bad? Because the USSR is inefficient as they have no competition in their economy, making inefficient machinery. Also, it lost the Cold War. It was in the USSR's incentive to prefer dictatorships over democracies because they are far more non-reliant on the changing mood of the populace and easier for them to control, meaning they actively tried to create them and bribe leaders accordingly. What are the implications of this? We have more jobs, more economic upliftment, and food security for millions of people over the span of decades. We're able to get Western FDI and low interest loans while giving African countries the sovereignty they deserve. We have a long-term cash cow on team opposition. We win this debate. I think second off um, invites that drop. Uh, hi, am I audible? All right, uh, I'll take your eyes in chat. Starting in three, two, one. The fight to elevate post-colonial Africa was always meant to be a war against poverty, not against poor people. The problem with the opposition case was a misunderstanding of context. This was not the modern day Western world. This was 20th century Africa that was rife with poverty and inequality when the colonizers left. They can preach of democracy all they want and say accountability 10 times in the same minute. But when real and visceral suffering occurred, that was blood on their hands. All of the economic context you hear from First Prop went completely unengaged with by this opposition team. Because I want you to note, if you really look at your notes, their only strategy was just to squirrel around the burden and counter assert, hey, here's another issue, but only Prop weighed specifically both of these concerns with one another. The only thing we heard later on was that some of these policies were likely to be given to people anyways, that people won't be dirt poor. Obviously, it's true that people will still have some food on the table. The question was, was that enough to break you out of the poverty cycle? Was that enough for social mobilization? Was that enough for black people who have been historically oppressed to be able to build businesses and start up their own communities, even if they are oppressed by the majority? There was a baseline low-hanging fruit that team opposition wanted to argue for. They could not co-opt our benefits. Let's clarify the burden here. I think the first opposition set an extremely high burden for themselves because they not wanted to defend a democracy. They wanted to defend a healthy, flourishing democracy because all of their principles and impacts were contingent upon this initial claim, which meant given our second argument from first prop explains to you why most of these democracies aren't going to be as healthy and as inclusive as they claim because wealth begets the most power within that democracy means all of their principles don't, principles fall because their initial representation does not work. Given we've proven the people with most amount of power control the levers of the democracy, their representation does not stand. But the second thing I want to do is that most of their harms just come from stem from the original premise that there is conflict. But the reason why conflict doesn't make sense is because of first ops own setup. They say that people have similar wants. If it's true that different ethnicities and tribes have similar, similar wants, then going to conflict makes absolutely no sense because they will lose the common goal, they will lose resources and they will lose their property and lands. Clearly, if they have a common goal, we can use that same common goal to be able to extract concessions from the colonizers, to be able to get these economic and land reparations together. So if you have common goals, we're just using the same common goals to be able to make all of us more wealthy. Team UAE lost this debate not because of our responses, because of the way their own case responds to itself. So therefore, what is the burden here? We explain that they have to prove now why their democracy was likely to be very, very good, because that was what they set up for themselves. In comparison, they have to provide status quo 
example, where most countries actively used civil and political rights were going to be successful. Most of the failures you've seen is where co countries in Africa have been, have been put in very destitute situations and they have to engage with those contexts specifically. If we're able to prove that economic and land reparations would be way better for these people, we were already winning this debate. Before that, I'll be happy to take a point. Right. If governments are inherently racist or democracies are never flourishing, then how do you ever get equitable distribution of land? First, both sides assume it's the same actor, it's the same government. So clearly, if it's a bad faith actor, then none of your rights will also be equitably distributed because the people at the top want to preserve their power for themselves. Second, assuming they were still able to be racist or any forms of bigotry, laws and rights are contingent upon enforcement. So just because it's written in the constitution, we protect your right to property, we protect your right to free speech. If they are still racist, then they're likely to not have enforcement. But secondly, I think the the way this works is most of the racism doesn't come directly from the get-go because clearly at this point, all tribes have the common goal of exiling the oppressor. So once the colonizer has left, you don't have these forms of innately evil incentives. Most of these things only come because you're able to hijack the political system. So given that we've told you the hijacking of the political system comes from the way you're able to hoard wealth from first prop that went completely unresponded to, this does not stand. So even if we don't get complete benevolence, the way it works is because we don't have these innate incentives from the very get-go means you're better able to hold them accountable over time. First, issue. Can we actually get our policy? So I want to know they have two main responses here. The first is that they claim in second op that economic issues are not the expertise of liberation leaders. I want you to reread your notes and consider whether this is persuasive because clearly if you want to build an entire democracy from ground up, you also needed assistance. So if you wanted technocrats and consultants to build your political institutions, clearly we could get the same people as well. But second, their side claims that this will lead to major conflict in between inter-tribes. But what's the comparative? Presumably, if wealthy ethnicities were so invested in preser preserving their own power and wealth, then they were also very, very averse to giving up political rights because it means that other ethnicities can challenge democracy, can use the free media and free speech to challenge their authority. So once again, we need to assume some good faith. Under the side of prop, the reason why they will want to give up those lands is because they can use the rhetoric of, we are revitalizing the economy. We are reducing poverty. We are attracting, we are attracting investment. We are reclaiming the land that was once stolen by the colonizing oppressors. And that is why it's likely to be something that gets popular support as well. But then later on, they, they want to claim they wanted to co of our benefits, which I want to know concedes the merit of our policy. So if they want to claim 20 years down the line, if they also want to co opt the benefits of this getting the land redistribution back, then clearly you also have to make the majority mad because you still have to seize their land at some point. The difference here is that if you wait 20 years to seize their land in the future, that's when they've already hijacked the political system because of their wealth. So if they wanted to be mad at you, then they'll be mad at you far worse on their side because you're not on equal ground. Immediately post-independence is when it's the most equal ground because that's when we can reconstruct our society to a new level. Then, therefore, if given we've proven this is able to work, here are three categorical pieces of weighing for why economic and land reparations need to be prioritized. The first was that in terms of the immediacy of outcome, given that you're able to alleviate the most excessive problems that exist in status quo. So clearly not all of them have no on the table, but we're able to enable people to break the poverty cycle, which affects everyone on that on a good level. But second, I want you to know that votes are still likely to be highly unimpactful because you're delegating your political power to someone else and they make decisions on behalf of you. The difference here is that money gives you autonomy for you to decide what's best for yourself. Political votes are way more uncertain in terms of outcome because you may vote for someone else, but you still have other interests that are still ignored. So for example, if there are three ethnicities, but only two of those ethnicities get their elected representatives in power, that one ethnicity is still likely to be ignored per their own analysis that they're likely to have differences within them. The difference is that wealth is getting given towards those communities. Even if some communities have less, have, are still oppressed under our side because of different the difference is wealth can then protect yourself. You can create self-sustaining communities. You can then trade with different things, which means that you remove your biases and say this, this is a person from another ethnicity because we're all engaging on economic grounds. The second thing I want to talk about here is the ability to exercise, exercise our rights. Prop simplifies the debate. From the start, we were charitable and took the trade-off. It was Yes, you would get votes. Yes, you get free speech. But it was low-hanging fruit because in, instead of claiming you can get free speech and free association, you had to prove why it was meaningful. We told you why when you had all these people 
It also meant that the, the, the people in power are the ones that are most likely to be able to use these levers of the political institutions. Things like you'll never be able, you're able to go to court, but whether you can win the court case is something entirely different. I want to note that their response here was saying people can vote in democracy to tackle any issue. By taking them on your best possible grounds, democracy needed bypassing bureaucracy. You need to compete with other public policies, such as criminal justice or education. The final thing was then about FDI. The other claim was that FDI from the West comes here. First, FDI is more likely to happen on our side because the wealth is more equitably distributed, the natural resources are able to have more disposable incomes for all consumers. But second, even if the West refused to enter, we still have the BRICS investment bank. We have the BRI from China who are still willing to invest even if you're not completely democratic. But thirdly, it ignores the initial premise that we proved to you from our third argument, which went unresponded to, which eventually people become more politically literate, become, people become more politically conscious when you're able to have this wealth in your hands. The conclusion of this is it's time we call it for what it is. The Failure for land reforms was state sanctioned violence. We are very proud to propose. I thank the third drop and invite the third drop. Uh, am I audible and visible? You are, yes. All right. Three, two, one, go. Ladies and gentlemen, I must say today is Malaysia's lucky day because I've chosen to be extremely charitable to that case. Now let's understand, let me take them at their best. Let's assume money is the most important thing in this debate, that money is what is going to guarantee the African people get real development. So let's look at the two areas of clash in this debate that actually matter. Number one, FDI, and number two, I'll be talking about equitability and development beyond that. But let's look at FDI. The responses to this clash were equal to the amount of resources Africa had back then in their backward economy. Very limited. Because not only have they chosen not to reply to this, they tell us China and BRI, which happened like 30, 40 years after this period of time. So we tell you, what have we told you about this, this clash? We firstly told you that because of these limited resources, they desperately need like businesses from especially the West who have large amounts of resources to actually invest in the long run. These long-term investments, not only from these businesses, but also like countries in the West and also multilateral institutions are guaranteed on our side because of the democratic signaling that took place during this civil war, during the Cold War period. And we tell you that because of the fact that the United States wants to portray this idea of democracy and also these businesses, why do we tell you this? We tell you firstly, these businesses fear nationalization. We think that these businesses are also more likely to invest in areas that are more economically stable or more likely politically stable because we think that those guarantee better long-term investment areas. Thirdly, we tell you, as I said earlier, that no one really cares about the fairness of the economy in the beginning. They care more about the fact that they have to be supporting democratic countries. And that signaling is extremely important in this period of time. So what do they tell us then? They say, China, I've already told you how that's a bad actor. And I mean, how that's an irrelevant actor because they weren't really in a position to invest at this period of time. But what actor actually ends up investing is the USSR. We told you how the USSR is a bad actor because of the fact that they have unstable investment. They literally broke down like a couple of decades later. And moreover, we tell you that their incentive is completely different from the West because their incentive is not to maintain this democratic signaling. Therefore, they have no checks and balances on the way they actually invest which means these investing processes are largely unaccountable and largely feed into like particular dictatorships and autocratic governments in these African regions. And moreover, we tell you that that incentive is to control because they can do so by establishing good trust and faith with these dictatorships and control the resources of Africa. We think this is bad. But even at their best case, let's assume the West does actually invest. I'm going to, even though they didn't mention this, I'm going to say, okay, let's assume the West actually does invest. We think this West actor is actually bad because we think that the West when investing in a non-democratic country, firstly has a no sort of political government that can actually engage with them democratically, which means they're more likely to be hostile and they're more likely to actually look to try and displace power. This looks like the US in, in the Middle East where they were forced to try and like change up the political stability of the country. This of course creates political vacuums moreover. Thirdly, we tell you this can also create proxy wars between the US and the USSR, creating further political instability in the region. Fourthly, lack of public transparency also means that the US can engage with this government without actually the people knowing what's going on, without them having the option to actually hold their government accountable for these foreign relations. So we already win on this slash. This is an independent path to victory. We're giving you this money. We have more money on our side because this amount of money that they're trying to redistribute is very limited. We have money in the long run and that's 
that's coming from outside. And we think this foreign investment is extremely important in the development of the technology industry and also in the development of agriculture and things like that. Coming to the, uh, another area of clash, which is the clash I must give credit to. I mean, they have engaged with this at least. So let's look at equitability in development, right? We tell you apart from that, uh, that front, we're also going to win on this front. Why? Because we tell you the crux of this clash is the fact that we can co op their benefits, prevent their worst harms, but they do not get our best benefits. Why? Let's assume for a second. My first and second speaker told you extensively why these leaders who are going to be carrying out these actions, going to be carrying out these operations, have bad incentives. But I'm going to assume for their sake, because I want to be charitable today, I'm going to assume these are great people with great incentives. They love their country. They love their nation. These days, I'm particularly talking about people who have these polit the political will and capital to actually go on doing these land distribution methods. Firstly, when they say economic rights will somehow give access to healthcare, education, quotas and jobs, wow. The problem is there are no jobs to give quotas in, right? We tell you that this is an underutilized economy where this massive inflation, there are, it's economically unstable. So the immediate short-term impacts of this economic sort of benefit doesn't really exist. We tell you there isn't enough domestic money to distribute in the form of cash transfers. We tell you that there is, the, the nation is yet to tap into these natural resources and they have no expertise or methods to actually go about doing so. Thirdly, these leaders are politicians, right? They, they are largely father figures probably held out in the freedom movement and whatnot. These people have no experience in economic policy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not forget land distribution at this scale, especially in a, like an area like Africa is a radical policy that involves so much of like good economic expertise. Now, of course, to this, they have an interesting response. When I asked this POI, they say, well, you need resources even and expertise even for like political institutions to create them as well. Firstly, you need less political resources to have, or less resources in general in order to create political institutions. Secondly, we told you we get foreign help that's exclusive to our side because multilateral institutions like the United Nations set up special agencies for Africa. They will only assist Africa if these nations choose to want to become democratic. They don't want to, especially in the time of the Cold War, these multilateral institutions are unlikely to help these countries set up autocratic institutions. And we don't think they will look to entrench these autocratic institutions even further as well, which is why you won't be able to create democracy in the future as well. Now, moreover, as, as my second speaker told you, it's easier to set up political institutions. You're more likely to mess up economic policy. But coming to what happens if these leaders actually manage to redistribute well, we tell you, even if these leaders successfully manage to create these quotas, create this brilliant land distribution, everything in the one actually happens. We still think this is a short term issue. We tell you that we give you an example of the great leap forward in China. We tell you how these autocratic governments, even in the temporary period, if they're able to create these short term sort of economic gratification because of lack of like number one, because of lack of checks and balances, they, you're entrenching greater power in these people, right? Number two, we tell you because of lack of the transparency of information and accountability within the system of like actually going about executing these policies or whatever they try to create. We think that in the long run, what tends to happen is that eventually rash decisions and things like that overturn these economic benefits. We think that in the long run, you're still not going to be able to guarantee economic policy is going to be good. And we, did, we don't really get any mechanization from them on this. Thirdly, we tell you that these leaders are particularly people who, as they said, care about their nation are probably likely to do something. They want to do something good for the country. We think this is particularly bad because these are leaders who think they're the only ones who can actually do what's good for their country. Therefore, they're more likely to think that their unilateral decisions are right and self just for it. And moreover, they have the ability to coerce the public and make them believe that, you know what, we're doing this for the benefit of the nation and people have no choice but to listen to them. We tell you that, we give you the example of Hitler, who probably thought he was doing what's right for Germany. And this is exactly how autocratic governments are created. Number four, there's no incentive for people with so much power and the belief that they're going to do good for the country to actually end up creating democratic institutions in the future. So what do we tell you? We, they don't get democracy. We can still get all that money, which I told you in my first area of clash. But moreover, on the point of ethnic tensions, but before that, POI. You say in 01 that people are united by their hatred for the colonizer who was the West. Your entire model of development is contingent on the same governments collaborating with these oppressors. Why on earth would the people stand for this? Okay, firstly, they're different actors. We think that the oppressed, the, the, the colonizers, at least from the past, are not necessarily the same institutions. Like the United States is not necessarily the colonizing part that the African people actively hate. Moreover, even if these African people actually want to sort of, sort of prevent their governments from forming these relations from these particular countries like the United Kingdom or France, we still think that they at least have the option to do so by keeping these governments accountable and 
because of the transparency of information, they can control what kind of foreign relations, what kind of powers they collaborate with. Moreover, at least we have multilateral institutions investing. We don't even have that. So even if it's not particular countries, we still get that FDI. Moreover, ethnic tensions, we tell you, is a lot worse among tribes. We tell you leaders are forced to affiliate with certain tribes and prioritize their needs, which means when they talk about how the black majority is probably not going to have enough power, you're actually letting the white majority control the narrative, at least to some extent. Even if, okay, sure, it's not going to be great levels of accountability. On our side, these black people at least have a voice, the minorities have a voice, and these ethnic tensions can actually be negotiated peacefully through democratic means. We at least have some methods of accountability in the short term, and we create better long-term governments. We actually have money on our side. We don't have any of this. We win this debate. Thank you. I thank the third top speaker, and I invite the op reply. I'm going to begin <clears throat> in, okay, just give me a sec. I'm going to begin in three, two, one. Panel, I'm personally insulted today because I spent three minutes of my life I'll never get back. You spent three minutes of yours noting it down, and the spectators met, spent, met, spent three minutes looking at me speak about FDI. Their only response to this is that they get FDI from China as well through the Belt and Road Initiative panel, which was founded in 2013. I was seven years old when the Belt and Road Initiative came out, and I promise you I was not born in post-colonial Africa. If there is urgency on their side of the house to actually address things like economic distribution, they do not get, they cannot count on FDI that comes 30 years later. We win this debate on FDI. Umar spends only 40 seconds actually responding to this. They assert that wealth is equitably distributed, and that's why the West contributes. We tell you that even if it is, there are two reasons the West does not contribute. One, that businesses are scared of going to a socialist place, simply because they've heard from their white or like white contacts within these nations that land is being seized, land is being distributed, and that property is volatile. And secondly, because of things like McCarthyism, because of the fact that you're unlikely to actually want to like go to a socialist state because of the backlash you face from your own people as the torchbearers of democracy, as the first people to engage in capitalism. You do not get FDI from the West. They give us an even if and say China BRI. Obviously, that's not in the scope of any debate, even closely resembling anything before 2012. We tell you then that not only do they miss out on Western funding that we exclusively get, and this is an independent path, and I'll prove that later, they also have a harmful actor in the form of the USSR, because the USSR steps in where the West doesn't. And we tell you these have insane harms because the USSR is unstable. They lost the Cold War. We tell you that the USSR has a tendency to become dictatorial, become autocratic. This is even worse for their economic and land redistribution because you're giving it to an autocracy. Now, why does this win us this debate? Because you can distribute land even to its best, 120% on their side of the house, but the land is still inherently unproductive because of the fact that the country has been plundered by colonizers, because of the fact that there are no industries in place because the British took everything. Even in the most equitable manner, the West is still much better on our side of the house because the West is the richest actor in the world. The West gets Africa into the Commonwealth. Literally, because it's more money, we still win this debate. I find it quite funny that their speaker says, well, why would you want to take money from Britain after everything they did to you? Because they did everything to me and now I get to feast on their money. Simple response. We get equitable land redistribution. This is a second independent path to victory that we don't need, but we get anyway. But this isn't important because they don't get equitable distribution. We tell you on our side that you have bad, act on their side, you have a bad actors just like you have on ours. You have people that are elite. You have people with political affiliations, people that are power hungry. We tell you liberation leaders are unnecessarily glorified because of the fact that they did, they made certain sacrifices that other people didn't. But we don't think that they're the selfless individuals people make them out to be. We do think that they do have political affiliations. Their response to this is that it's symmetric. But panel, that cannot be enough. Because if we rely on flourishing democracy, they rely on equitable distribution. They cannot simply say that we don't get equitable distribution either. But here's why it's not symmetric. Because on our side, as democracy progresses, as democracy grows, and you eventually have equitable land redistribution, you're able to counteract corrupt forces. You're able to counteract the power hungry. You're able to mitigate conflict with peace negotiation. You're able to do so 
with protests on their side of the house, let's assume the government does anything, everything right. It is still likely then that, a, that like a, a powerful tribe feasts on a minority, seizes their land, and then the minority has nothing they can do because they do not have democratic frameworks that help them protest, that help them form general assembly, as the first speaker said. So proud to have won this debate. Do give it to us. I thank op reply and invite shop reply. Yeah. yeah, I assume I'm audible. Okay, great. Starting in three, two, one. The same way I think it's a shame I have to spend four minutes walking through Team UAE with your hand held in order to understand the proposition case, I think that truly is a shame as well. Because the reason why opposition needs to lose this debate is because they could not continuously argue for equity, because they argued a democracy, and they had to accept any and all outcomes that individuals voted for and how the political system existed. So they couldn't unilaterally blanketly say that in the end, we would economically redistribute and everyone would be fine. You needed to defend the status quo and note that they kept on trying to pin the African status quo to us when a majority of African states chose more civil rights than economic rights. So the institutions that are corrupt right now are a byproduct of opposition's world, not ours. That in those same instances, that was the democratic process that they protected and never actually ensured find individuals on the ground, even when you gave each and every person a vote. Three clashes in this speech. Number one, on immediate relief versus the rights on paper. Secondly, as to wealth as a prerequisite to mechanizing political rights. And thirdly, how economic empowerment sets up the condition of a healthy democracy. Note that I think opposition in the first clash continuously tries to engage in a false model. Because when African-Americans and women in the US had no political rights, that did not mean we defaulted and we are an autocracy and a regime. They constantly try to engage in that contextualization, and that is the reason why they can't actually engage in our argumentations, and they were highly parallel and non-comparative. We use, and the only thing they have left standing is, would we distribute fairly? We gave you three mechanizations and three attacks that were never actually dealt with and responded to. We use number one, Op's own context against them. Op, when explaining why implementing civil and political rights would be done well, said that most individuals want to work together after coming out of colonial oppression. So when we redistribute land, if we all wanted to work together, we wouldn't have the levels of conflict and levels of injustice, given we all would likely agree to that. We told you, secondly, their analysis was symmetrical. It was sufficient because you are the only team in this debate trying to argue against the mechanization for any impacts to occur, because they wanted POP to defend literally nothing. Because if we can't implement our policies and we also don't have political rights, there is no comparative in this debate. The same way you would install your own family members as members of government would likely apply to you. But last, we say that even when you don't have enough money, and note that it's engaged in their best case, in their best and not their worst because we assume that they would be able to enforce all of their rights. We told you, number one, that you always had the initial capital to spur and give cash handouts to individuals that would, you would use to set up and enforce your democratic structures. But land redistribution and quotas literally required signing a bill. We never understood why it did not require any money. Their only response later on in third art was that there aren't enough actual jobs, but we think that the job creation and the FDI was the thing that created it. Note that therefore the only thing left standing from them is the idea that they have FDI. We told you in a first argumentation what FDI was perverse on their side. They just never wanted to actually engage with it and try to claim it as their own. The only thing that that that's the only thing left standing for how they can co-opt our benefits or else up to this debate from four speakers, they never actually engaged in the trade-off or the comparative. They said that they have more trust because they're not a quasi-democracy. We told you that the US, for example, or the idea that you're a democracy is not the singular thing as to what determines FDI and investment. We told you that in third proposition. The US massive Trades, trades with the CCP, a communist regime, and not a democracy, but there are strong trade relations. They didn't even hear our first argument on resource extraction, because we said purchasing power is what created good FDI to set up infrastructure, as opposed to FDI where they steal and rob your diamond mines and rob oil from individuals. They caught nothing in this debate, no comparative, no trade-off, their burden fails. Secondly, as well, prerequisite to mechanizing political rights. We told you why their case is 
their case and ours and ours comes prior. We told you in terms of weakening lobbyists and platforming and allowing participation required money in order to correct these social imbalances that were previously entrenched because of colonialism. The current, the status quo right now of corruption and imbalances isn't because, oh, the democratic structure was corrupt. It's because the colonialists set up these structures, we corrected it. Lastly, no engagement to economic empowerment. We told you how we slowly mobilized individuals to levels of political consciousness where we would eventually set up a strong democracy where individuals actually held them accountable, side with prop.